and I assume that we are live. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tom Logan. I'm chairman of Fly Fishers International Board Conservation Committee, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to Fly Fishers International Online Season 2. These webinars are your webinars. They're intended to share information with you that we think will be interesting to you and hopefully will contribute in some way to your expanded enjoyment of fly fishing wherever you fly fish. Perhaps most importantly is that they're only made possible with your support as members of FFI. And again, these are your webinars. So we hope you enjoy tonight. Tonight's webinar focuses on conservation of fishes and their habitats. This is one of our conservation webinars. Your attendance tonight suggests to me that you probably share my commitment to conservation of our natural landscapes, our lands and waters. It's essential to our enjoyment of the outer doors, our fly fishing, and in my mind, our enduring qualities of life. Fact is, conservation is just that important to all of us. We focus specifically tonight on saving Western rivers to preserve the fishes that depend on them for habitat and preserving our continuing opportunities for fish for those fishes. Before I introduce tonight's guest who will give the presentation, I'd like to introduce also Jake McLaughlin, who is on our staff in Livingston, Montana, our headquarters staff that'll be standing by to fix any technical problems I might create for all of us. And also Bruce Williams. I'm pleased to have Bruce Williams helping tonight. Bruce is also chairman of our board casting programs committee, a very important person on our board of directors. And he'll be monitoring the questions that you type in tonight in the, under the question and answer button at the bottom, not the chat, the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please know these and other webinars on other topics, certain conservation are being recorded for viewing at any time you'd like to go back to them and view them. The title of our program tonight is Sometimes to Save a River, You Have to Buy It. And it'll be presented by Mr. Jim Cox of the Western Rivers Conservancy. And with that, Bruce, I, I will turn the floor over to you and also acknowledge that uh, you're on the board of directors for the service conservancy. And uh, if you will, let's give a proper introduction to Jim for us tonight. Thank you, Bruce, you have the floor. Thank you, Tom, I will do my best. Um, as Tom mentioned, I'm on the board of FFI as well as Western Rivers Conservancy. And I would like to make a couple of comments about how those interests came together for me. I have been passionate about fly fishing and fly casting for more than 30 years. I have been actively involved with FFI for over 15 years. Mostly my focus has been on the fly casting program but I have watched the commitment to conservation grow under the tutelage of Tom Logan and Dave Peterson. FFI defines itself as a model of collaboration and it has forged partnerships with great conservation organizations like the Bonefish Tarpon Trust and Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. I would like to see FFI explore that kind of partnership with Western Rivers. Quality fishing depends on quality waters. So preserving and protecting the waters we have is of paramount importance. When I retired from the Nature Conservancy of Arizona board, I was delighted to find Western Rivers using the same science-based protection strategies as TNC and their focus was perfectly aligned with my interests, rivers and streams in the West. I met Jim at Spayarama at a Spayarama event at Golden Gate Casting Club, and he really piqued my interest in becoming involved with Western Rivers. Jim's official title is Director of Donor Relations, and he is also a very accomplished fly fisher. Unofficially, he is the Director of Fly Fishing Expeditions, and you might want to ask him about that. 
I am pleased to introduce Jim and turn the program over to him now. Oh, thank you so much, Bruce. It's uh, it's just a joy to be here tonight. Thanks for uh, having us uh, to present. Uh, this is really exciting. I think what I'm going to take a second right now to do a little screen share so we can show you some great photography and talk about some of the rivers that we've been working on. Let me just get that going here and we will start. So Western Rivers Conservancy, uh, we have been around doing conservation since uh, 1988. And uh, as Bruce mentioned, I'm a fly angler. I learned about Western Rivers Conservancy by reading fly fishing magazines and saw the work that this organization was doing to protect some of the uh, fly fishing rivers that I really enjoyed fishing on and ones that I wanted to be fishing on. And you may have seen our uh, motto before, which is sometimes to save a river, you have to buy it. Um, well, and to be fair, you can't buy a river, right? but you can purchase the land that's right adjacent to a river. And this is really important because when you own property, you can immediately do the right thing for the river system. For example, if you buy a ranch, a cattle ranch, on day one, you can get the cattle off the riparian. Now I'm not against cattle ranching and I like a beefsteak as much as the next guy, but there's a right place for cattle and there's a, a place that's not good for them. And on a outstanding stream, you don't want them on the riparian. So that's something you can do on day one. You don't even need any kind of public input on that if you own it. You can do the same if you're buying a piece of commercial timberland. You can decide that we're not gonna clear cut it day one. We're gonna let it grow and be more of a natural forest. So you have power right from the very beginning by buying lands. Um, Western Rivers Conservancy has a razor focus, which is what makes our work so, uh, so important and, 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 and effective. Uh, Western Rivers Conservancy protects outstanding river ecosystems in the Western United States. Uh, by that, we protect the best of the best. We're really looking at protecting those rivers that can act whole or in part like a wild river system. And in the Western United States, I'll show you in a couple slides down where we're working. Um, number one, we acquire land to conserve critical habitats. So again, first and foremost for us, we are about conservation and protecting habitat for fish and for other wildlife. And by acquiring land, we work with willing sellers. That can be an individual, it can be a ranching family, it can be a timber company, it can be a power company, any entity that is willing to sell land along a river system. Secondly, we work to provide compatible public use and enjoyment. One of the reasons the fly fishing community likes our work so much is that we have taken previously private lands and opened them up to public access. And it's not just about fly fishing for us, it's also about camping, for hunting, for boating, for bird watching, all of those type of activities that are compatible with enjoying the river and also protecting it. And finally, we cooperate with other agencies and organizations to secure the health of the entire ecosystem. There are some organizations that purchase lands that hold them long-term. Uh, we do not do that. We use a different model. We always convey to a long-term steward. And some of those stewards have been in the past uh, federal agencies, Fish and Wildlife, the BLM to create angler and hunting access, the Forest Service. We occasionally work with Native American tribes. We occasionally work with other land trusts that do not have the capacity to be able to purchase lands, but do have the capacity to steward them over time. And sometimes working with states to create state parks. And you're gonna see examples of all of these in here. One of the reasons that we're important, particularly if we're working with governmental agencies, is that you, you kind of wonder, well, why don't they just buy it outright if they want it? And the issue is, is they have to get it into an appropriation. And that can take two, four years sometimes. So we're there, we know which governmental agencies want to be able to purchase these lands to protect them permanently for conservation purposes and for access. We'll able to, we go in, we take the risk position, we buy it, and then we hold it until those, uh, those governmental agencies are able to get the appropriation for it. And oftentimes we help them find the appropriation money. This is a map 
of the area that we work in. So these are the 11 Western states where we're active. We've been around 30 years. We've worked and conserved more than 190 different rivers and streams during that time in those 30, 32 years. Um, this is a map now of the current projects we have. We have more than 20 active projects going in seven Western states. And we're just gonna hit on a few projects. You're gonna get a 30,000 foot overview of what we're doing in this program tonight. There's always limited funds. So how do we decide which rivers we're going to actually go and purchase land on? Well, first and foremost, again, we're looking to protect intact river ecosystems. We're really looking to find those rivers that are outstanding that we can protect for the long term. Secondly, we're looking at projects that have what we call meaningful scale and assemblage. And by that, we're not only looking to protect the properties that we buy, but by buying those properties and turning them over to a long-term steward, we are protecting a larger sense of the ecosystem, that these are important properties, not just for the property itself, but the entire ecosystem. So for meaningful scale can sometimes be what we've done on the John Day or the Klamath, which you'll hear about is buying miles and miles and miles of river. But sometimes it can be something small, what we call the hole in the donut. It can be a small piece of property that's surrounded by a lot of public lands. And that small piece of property has a really key tributary stream on it. And you'll see examples of that in this presentation as we go along. Um, cold water refuges, again, our, our rivers are getting warmer and warmer uh, because of development, because of climate change, because there, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why our rivers are getting warmer. And particularly for trout, for steelhead, for salmon, all those salmonids that need cold, cold water to survive. We're work, working to protect those properties that, that ensure a cold water future for these fish. Again, coming back to great fishing streams and recreational access. Um, you know, this is you know, not, not all our be all and end all, but I would say a good 75 to 80% of the projects we have have a strong public access component. And when they don't, it's really because either that piece of uh, property is truly not accessible or it's such a fragile piece of ecology that it really isn't compatible to have any other access there. And at this point, I'm gonna start and talk about some of the projects we've done. And for the fly fishing community, uh, maybe the most uh, well-known is our work on the Madison River at the $3 bridge. And this was a project we did in 2002. And it was one of the very first projects that we uh, asked the fly fishing community to help us fund. Uh, Trout Unlimited was a big partner in this, the Orvis Company, was a big partner in uh, promoting uh, our ability to be able to purchase these lands. This is right at the $3 bridge. This was a uh, 4,400 acre property. And uh, one of the issues on this property, um, well, let's say first, we know that the Madison is one of the great fly fishing streams in the Western United States. <clears throat> and every time I look at this photo, I wanna be there. <laughs> you know, we have just great fish, um, uh, just uh, an iconic stream. <clears throat> excuse me, one of the issues though, was in 2002 that this property had the potential to become a commercial development for residential. And so we were able to go in, we bought a hundred acres along three miles of the riparian of the uh, river system and worked with another conservation landowner <clears throat> to buy the other 4,300 acres of uplands we're able to put it into permanent conservation uh, easement and, and basically protected for all time the access there onto the Madison River. And, uh, and if you go there today, you will see this structure. This is a, a commem commemoration of all of the people that helped fund the major gifts for this project at the $3 bridge. And also to give you a little bit of shade if you're a little tired of fly fishing. Uh, the largest project that we have uh, in terms of scope, scale, and price is our work on the Klamath River. And the Klamath River is a river that starts in um, South Central Oregon and flows through California, Northern California, through Redwood Country, out into the Pacific Ocean. And uh, 
this is a 47,000 acre commercial timberland purchase from Green Diamond Resources, a $60 million project. And just to give you an idea of how we fund projects, um, my, as Bruce mentioned, I'm the director of donor relations. The, the funds that we bring in, I'm, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. The funds that we bring in, <clears throat> that I bring in, cover the cost of appraisals, environmental assessments, the legal work that we have to do with mineral rights, water rights, as well as keeping the lights on. Um, and then <clears throat> oftentimes we will have a foundation that gives us what are called program related investments or PRIs. They're, they're like a bank loan, except oftentimes below market or at zero interest that helps us actually buy the capital. For this project, it was a little different because we were working with the Native American tribe and there was no way that the tribal entity was gonna be able to pay us off to be able to do this $60 million project. And so in California, we bought 47,000 acres of timber. That is, uh, there's a, a climate mitigation funds for carbon sequestration. So we were able to use that as a funding mechanism we're working with a tribal entity and there's a government tool in the tax code called New Markets Tax Credits that we were able to use. In, in general, what I'm really trying to say is we have a lot of different uh, legs on the stool to be able to let us fund these. And, we're, and it's really innovative stuff that we've been able to do just on a, on a financial side. The reason this single project is important is because of Blue Creek. And uh, the Klamath River is one of the places that I like to fly fish. I try to go there every fall on the lower Klamath and swing flies for a steelhead and occasionally even get into a Chinook salmon like this, swinging for steelhead. It's rare, but it happens. Um, and this project is all about those fish. It's about salmon and steelhead. And the fact that the Klamath River uh, is one of the only non-jetty, non-channelized rivers, major rivers on coastal rivers on the West Coast. And it gets a, a historic sandbar that builds up there. And in August and September, historically, either the tribal members or a weather event would run a hole through that sandbar. And these fish would come into the Klamath River, cold Pacific Ocean water. But because of development uh, you know, over the last 100 years, the Klamath has gotten warm. The river gets up to the high 70s and builds a, a, you know, an algae bloom at the mouth of the river. And salmon and steelhead cannot handle the, those temperatures. Blue Creek that this project is on is 16 miles from the mouth of the Klamath. It is the first major cold water refuge that these fish hit. Every single salmon and steelhead that swims up the Klamath River stops at Blue Creek. And when they're there, they stop there for at least 12 hours and they, their body temperatures drop on average eight degrees Fahrenheit. It is an insurance policy for the entire fish population of the Klamath. If anything happened to Blue Creek, uh, particularly with a commercial timber area, if there was sediment that got into the stream that stopped it flowing cold to that area, it, <laughs> the fish would not be able to make it to the next major tributary, which is another 30 odd miles upstream on the Trinity River. So just really important. This, this project protects nine miles of Blue Creek, more than 25 miles of the Klamath and another 25 miles of tributary streams. To show you a map of where we are here, uh, Blue Creek, the, the upper part of Blue Creek has been protected in the Siskiyou wilderness, but the last nine miles were on commercial timberland. This in the dark yellow, this mustard, is gonna be permanently protected as conservation lands for, with the Yurok tribe that has a very sophisticated fisheries biology department. The lighter yellow is areas that the tribe will be able to do over time some commercial harvest, but it's gonna be different than most other commercial harvests. For example, instead of having a 40 to 60 year turnover, it's gonna have a 70 to 100 year turnover. No pesticides, no clear cutting. So really working much more ecologically in the areas that are still viable for timber harvest and using that, those funds to help protect Blue Creek for the long term. Um, on top of it, on top of the fish, uh, this, there's old growth forest here that's very important for marbled murrelet. Uh, this is a, a bird that needs old growth forests. Uh, and so this is a really important 
species that's being protected there as well, um, as well as some redwoods. I mean, a lot of the, again, this is commercial timberland. There aren't a lot of them there, but this is less than a half mile from Blue Creek and it will allow for these trees to be preserved. And over time, maybe not in our lifetime, but these trees will be coming back. And the tribe is working on forestry right now. They're working on decommissioning logging roads to keep sediment from getting into the stream and a long-term forestry plan to protect this part of the river. We like, and as I mentioned, scale and assemblage. I mean, th that's a large project in itself, but we like working and continuing to work in river basins. So the Scott River in California is a major tributary to the Klamath River. Um, this is a 1500 acre project that we have been working on and its key is protecting of coho salmon. And this was a, a fact that stunned me when I heard it. The South Fork of Scott, Scott River produces one half of all of the coho salmon in the entire state of California. And I, just an amazing statistic. And the mil millions of dollars have been put in to protect these upper tributaries to, to, because these fish are threatened throughout the, uh, the West Coast. So really important work. Uh, to show you a map of how this works, this is our uh, Klamath River project here on Blue Creek. There's the Klamath River uh, at the mouth near just south of Crescent City. It flows up through here, up, up through uh, Happy Camp and Syed, California into Oregon. And between Happy Camp and Syed, there's the South Fork Scott and all the way up here in this little red section here that's in the uh, offset is the uh, uh, Bouvier Ranch. And that's the project, uh, the, the property that we bought. It has a senior water right on there that pulls, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it pulls 2.6 CFS water out. But it's enough that in the summertime when these fish are coming in and spawning and in the fall, sometimes there's not enough water for them. So this will uh, pr provide important year round stream and year round flow for these fish to make sure that they have habitat once they get all the way up there for spawning and rearing. And then the very headwaters of the entire Klamath River system start in the state of Oregon. And the, the three main rivers that create Klamath Lake that start Klamath River are the Williamson, the Wood, and the Sprague. And for those of us that love to fly fish, the Williamson River is known to have some of the largest trout outside of the state of Alaska. Uh, just an amazing uh, trout stream. It's known for its uh, June hexagenia hatch. But this project not only is great for fish, but it's also a major migratory bird project. If you look at this picture of the Williamson, you're gonna see just how great those wetlands are, just great marshlands. And in this part of Oregon, there are six uh, separate uh, wildlife refuges collected, connected with the Klamath Marsh National Wildlife Refuge. And this property that we bought is going to be, help birds like the shoveler and 200 other species. Uh, show you a map of where we are. We are in South Central Oregon. Uh, the the uh, California border is below where this map is, as is the Klamath Lake. This is uh, the Williamson River right here. And right across from the Klamath Marsh National Wildlife Refuge was this property in red, which is on three miles of the Williamson River. It was a former cattle ranch, had been so for a century. It had been dewatered, so none of this property looked like that beautiful picture before. It was you know, basically grazed heavily. The great thing about buying this property is we were able to buy it with uh, funds that, are, that come from the bird stamp uh, that Hunters Guild, so it's a migratory bird conservation fund that, that helped us purchase these properties and convey them to uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service for inclusion into the Klamath Marsh National Wildlife Refuge. So it added about 20% to that upper refuge there. This property also has a senior water right on it on 1500 acres that will be put back in stream that will, uh, that will protect the water quality and pH balance of the river all the way down to Klamath Lake. And also this, just by leaving this property away from the cattle, these grasses will come back by themselves. The willows will come back by themselves and create just great marshland habitat again for critters like this king rail, these cinnamon teal, trumpeter swans, and a host of other migratory birds, as well as this providing more cold water for those great uh, trout that live in the Williamson River. Kind of moving uh, into the interior west, 
We've done a lot of work on the Rio Grande and the upper Rio Grande system, uh, starting in 2006 and working currently. Um, over 18,000 acres. To show you a map, the, the properties in red are the different properties we've worked on. We'll hit each of them uh, separately, but we are on the uh, Colorado, New Mexico border here, not far from Taos in uh, New Mexico. And this is some of the poorest uh, area in the state of Colorado. It's old uh, land grant, uh, Spanish land grant country, uh, the Alamosa and the, uh, the, the area here is, uh, has some of the least amount before we were working of, of public access of anywhere in the state of Colorado. And so we, this is the San Luis Hills and the San Luis Valley that we're in. And we helped create the San Luis Hills State Wildlife Area and 1,700 acres of that 18, uh, of, uh, of uh, 17,000 acres of that 18,000 acres was this piece of property itself, the uh, Olguin and the Brownie Hills Ranch properties. On a section of the Rio Grande, and again, the Rio Grande runs for 2,000 miles. Its headwaters are up in Colorado. Um, and a lot of us think of the Rio Grande as being this dewatered river that you know flows into the Gulf of Mexico and it's dammed and there's not a lot of water. But up in Colorado and up in New Mexico. This is a really vital stream with cold water. And this section here that we bought, the Brownie Hills Ranch, is again just incredible migratory bird property and a significant piece of property in an area where there was very little uh, public access before. So this was ultimately conveyed to Castilla County with, land, with, with funding from a Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, and you'll notice that there's 95% of the Sand Hill Crane population in that Rocky Mountain Flyway visits this area of Colorado every year, as long as 200 other species of birds. So really important uh, wetland, you know, migratory and wetland bird uh, habitat. The fishing uh, part of the story is what we've done on the Rio de los Pinos in Colorado. And this was a project that we started in 2006 and ultimately have conveyed to the Rio Grande National Forest in two different parcels. Um, and this is a piece of property, a ranch owned by the Garcia family who had been ranching for many, many decades and wanted to do something of significance <laughs> and legacy for the river. Uh, the Pinos uh, would be considered one of the great blue ribbon trout streams, except for the fact that prior to this, there wasn't a lot of public access to it. Uh, most of the folks in New Mexico and Colorado uh, think about fishing on the Caneos, which the Pinos is a tributary to. But this is a really great uh, little trout stream, uh, good cold water, and if you look at the map here, you can kind of see an, an interesting fact about the states of Colorado and Wyoming. Um, some of our Western streams, like in Montana and Oregon, California, if you enter at a public access site and you're above the high water mark, you're legal to be on the river. But in Colorado and in Wyoming, if you have property against the stream, the landowner not only owns that property, but they own the river bottom, which means that if you're in a drift boat and you hit a rock, you're trespassing. If you step in that river, you're trespassing, even if you enter at a public access point. So we have been able to purchase this stream. It goes along, purchase this property. It goes along Highway 17. And there's about a mile now of the uh, Rio de los Pinos that is accessible for public access, uh, which is really great for fly anglers in that area. And if you're visiting. And this is a picture of Dieter Erdmann, who actually is one of our project managers and made this project happen, uh, fly fishing with his dog. Um, besides just fly fishing, also it's important for us to create other recreational uh, areas. And so in Alamosa, which is the most populated town in the San Luis Valley, uh, we have worked on 197 acres to help create a city park. So you can see here this red in here, is providing uh, public access for uh, hiking and biking and really just a nice, beautiful area in Alamosa for people to enjoy the habitat and to provide additional protection for the river. And finally, another, this, again, this is a small one, 91 acres on the upper Rio Grande on Freeman's. But as I mentioned before, um, 
you know, the, if, if you own private property along the river, it's in particularly in this state, it's really hard to access it. And if you look at this map, you've got the Rio Grande National Forest here, you've got the, you have wilderness areas in here, but all along this section of the Rio Grande, this pink is private, private property, unable to access. And so we were able to get a small piece of property here that allows for public access. So you can go, you can do a float trip on the river when the, when the river is high enough to be able to do a float trip. You can also go out, bird watch, do whatever you like, do a little hiking, scenic, you know, scenic recreation. And also it has some great uh, habitat for birds as well. So even a small, you know, sometimes a small piece of property can be important for those of us that like to be able to recreate on a river. Moving to the state of Washington, in northwestern Washington is the Olympic Peninsula. And if there are any avid steelheaders that are attending this program, this is one of the crown jewels of places to go and swing a fly and catch some of the biggest steelhead in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we, you know, you think of the river like the Queets and the Soduck and the, the the hoe is, I believe, you know, the hump tulips, but the hoe is really the queen of all of these great Olympic Peninsula rivers. Uh, this is a project, a kind of legacy project for us that we started in 2001 and, and did through 2009. Um, again, this is uh, one of the great uh, fly fishing rivers uh, of the West. Uh, it, it's known to be uh, a little, uh, you know, it, it blows out quite quickly. So when there's a, a big water event, this river will blow out and it takes it a lot longer to restore. So you have to kind of time your time yourself to when you're going to go to fish it. Sometimes it's, you know, you just basically have to say, okay, I'm going to get up and go because it's time to fish. But it's an amazing stream. Um, this is a project that we did that worked with several different purchases of timberlands. And this map shows over nearly 30 miles of riparian on the Ho River. So the green up here is the Ho River that was has been long time protected in Olympic National Park. But this was all commercial timber property. And so we were to, able to buy several different purchases over an eight year period uh, to protect this riparian area and also some major tributary streams like Nolan Creek. Um, in addition, uh, this is really important old growth habitat for spotted owl. Uh, most of the funding that came for this project was for protection of the spotted owl, but uh, our fish get to benefit for it as well. We ultimately conveyed this property to an entity that we created called the Ho River Trust, and they have done a great work in uh, thinning out the commercial forest. There were issues that there wasn't enough light getting down to the forest floor to create a natural forest, working to reconnect some streams that had culverts in them. And ultimately, uh, the Nature Conservancy has done some purchases in this area as well. And so the Ho River Trust has conveyed those properties to the Nature Conservancy for long time stewardship, and they continue to work on a partnership on restoration, as well as the fish, just, you know, huge Roosevelt elk in these beautiful Sitka spruce forests. Uh, one of the uh, areas that Teddy Roosevelt, when it was created, went up to uh, the Olympic National Park, Olympic, mm -hmm. uh, Olympic Peninsula and helped create that park. And these uh, elk are his namesake. Um, moving into the state of Idaho uh, on the Salmon River. And the Salmon River has one of the world's longest uh, journeys for anadromous fish. Uh, the Salmon River, the salmon and steelhead that go up to the upper Salmon River in Stanley, Idaho, travel more than 900 miles, go over eight different dams, four on the Columbia system and four on the Snake system, and go over 6,200 feet in elevation. I mean, it's an amazing journey that they make. And this, this area has historically produced some of the largest numbers of salmon in the Columbia River system. However, you know, with again, with, with development that has, and particularly with the dams, it has become more, more difficult for these fish to survive. Uh, this is an area, if you look in here, this is the uh, Stanley, Stanley, Idaho, uh, the Sawtooth Wilderness area, the Hemingway Boulders Wilderness area. And you'll notice along the, the uh, Salmon River, again, we've got all this protection here of, uh, of federal lands, 
but along the river itself, there's a lot of private property. And on some of these private properties, there were really critical salmon spawning streams and steelhead spawning streams. And the Forest Service had been wanting to get their hands on those properties to protect them for their uh, conservation, long-term conservation for the spawning of these fish. So one of these properties was Pole Creek Ranch and the other was the uh, Goat Creek Falls Ranch. And we'll talk a little bit of this red property, the Pole Creek Ranch first. Um, this is a property that we bought on one mile of Pole Creek. Uh, it had been ranched with cattle on the riparian. The reason this creek is so important uh, and was important for the Forest Service to get its hands on and conserve was that its bottom is a volcanic bottom as opposed to a granite bottom of, 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 that a lot of the other uh, streams have in the Sawtooth Wilderness area. And that volcanic bottom creates a larger density of uh, insect life. So the fish, when they're spawning there and growing up, they actually have more protein. They get bigger, you know, they, it's just a better system for them to be able to, uh, to rear. Uh, and so we were able to purchase this property along with a little bit of the Salmon River on it and conveyed it to the Forest Service for long-term protection. And then up at Goat Creek Falls, this was the one that was north near closer to Stanley, Idaho. Again, we're looking at the sawtooths in the background. This is a property that, and if you look at the stream, it looks beautiful, but the property had a senior water right on it. And oftentimes when these fish were getting up there in the late summer and fall, this had a, a water right that was pulling water out of stream right when the fish needed to be there. So for the very first time in the history of Idaho, we were able as an organization to work with the Idaho Water Resources Board to permanently have them purchase the water right to permanently put it back in stream to protect these uh, fish. And it was important for them because they know that over 600,000 people a year visit the Salmon River system and many of those are anglers. So it was very important for them to, as a conservation uh, tool to be able to do this. And then a year after that, we were able to work in uh, another project on the headwaters of the Middle Fork Salmon. And again, this is one of those incredible streams. If you have not done the float of the Middle Fork Salmon, it is one of the truly great West Slope cutthroat trout fisheries uh, in the U.S. Maybe, maybe simply the best, as well as a 114-mile scenic float that will knock your socks off. Um, this project that we were doing is one of the hole in the donut properties. You look at this, you're looking at a lot of a uh, salmon chalice national forest, and this little red property in here, along Knapp Creek and Marsh Creek, um, was yet another property that was had a senior water right that was pulling 73 CFS out of the out of the stream the same time the salmon and steelhead were coming up. So for the second time in the history of the state of Idaho, we were able to work with the Idaho Water Resources Board to buy that water right, put it permanently back in stream, and protect the property and convey it to the Forest Service. In addition, this property again has just great uh, grasslands, marshlands, so beautiful herds of Rocky Mountain elk, and also a good population of sandhill cranes that visit this property as well. Moving to the Snake River system in Idaho. Uh, the Snake River uh, is one of those rivers, again, that I think many people that love to swing flies for steelhead know of. This is a project that's on nearly 3,000 acres, but our, our main focus on this wasn't so much fisheries. And again, we're a conservation organization. We're not a fly fishing organization, although many of us that are involved are avid fly anglers. But this one was really done for bighorn sheep. And this property, which is the 10 Mile Creek Ranch, is one of two properties on the, the Snake River system where it is known that most of the lambing that happens for these sheep uh, happens on these properties. And there is, and, and this is a very sensitive uh, uh, species. They oftentimes get a virus that is transferred from domestic sheep that can wipe out whole herds. So it's really important that we create areas that are vital for their uh, existence. So this has incredible habitat for their lambing. This is one of the projects that is not a public access project. This is such a sensitive property that this is one that we ultimately uh, worked with uh, the state of the state of Idaho and also a uh, 
a private conservation buyer by putting a conservation easement upon the property to protect it. Um, again, you can look at this, the map here where there's Lewiston, Idaho right there, Clarkson, and we're on four miles of the river itself of the Snake River, uh, additional about four miles of 10 mile creek. Uh, this property does have some amazing uh, habitat for uh, salmon reds that have been found along the river and also uh, for a lot of upland birds like this ruffled grouse, chucker, and others. McDermott Creek uh, is a property that's right on the Oregon-Nevada border. And McDermott Creek is one that's all about protecting Lahontan cutthroat trout. And Lahontan cutthroat trout are one of those species like bull trout that need extremely cold water. And it wasn't more than several decades ago that these trout were thought to have been extinct. And they found some extant populations in California and in Oregon in the Trout Creek Hills. Um, <clears throat> this ranch is a ranch that has been particularly well stewarded by the family that owns it. Uh, and uh, so you can see just how this great riparian is. One of the issues, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, McDermott Creek is that um, there have been non-native uh, trout species that have been uh, introduced into it. And so the Lahontan strain is not pure there. But the stream itself <clears throat> is connected to a lot, a series of uh, these small creeks in the Trout, trout uh, Hills wilderness up in here. And these creeks have been rock dammed off from the main part of McDermott Creek to protect that, uh, natural strain of Lahontan cutthroat. And so by, by buying this property, it will ultimately allow the state of Oregon and the state of Nevada to take the non-native fish that are in McDermott Creek out and then ultimately reconnect McDermott Creek to those side creeks where they're creating a true uh, pure strain of Lahontan cutthroat trout and adding about 55 miles of uh, spawning habitat for these fish. On top of it, this is great, you know, uh, upland bird uh, property and great sage grouse property as well. Um, the Yampa River, we're gonna go to Co Colorado again on the Yampa and the, and the Yampa is one in Colorado, one of the longest uh, sections of free flowing river. There is a dam up on it, but if you start on the Elk River, go to the Yampa, go to the Green and then to the Colorado. It's one of the longest float trips you can do uninterrupted without a dam. This is a, our first project on the Yampa was a 920 acre project on the Cross Mountain Canyon property. And this was a property on two miles on the warmer section of the uh, Yampa River. So its protection was really about native species that aren't sportsman species. species. They were Colorado pike minnows, humpback chubs, bony tailed chubs, razorback uh, suckers. Um, but these are all endangered species on that river. So really important for them. But one of the main issues with this property is that it was owned by a, uh, an owner that didn't want to allow public access, um, particularly public access for elk hunting. Uh, there's just amazing uh, Rocky Mountain elk populations in this. And if you look at this map, um, this red in here is the property and it, it controlled access to thousands of acres of BLM wilderness uh, area and wilderness study area, as well as another thousands and thousands of acres of just BLM public lands and the public couldn't get onto it. So we were able to work with, by purchasing the property and worked with the local BLM to, to ultimately convey it to the BLM for long-term stewardship, access for elk hunters, access for hikers. There's my, my understanding of talking to the, the head of the BLM, there's also a Native American sites on the property that they are um, cataloging. So just, to, and, and also for rafting as well, this uh, uh, purple area here is Dinosaur National Monument. So we're not that far from the Yampa River from flowing into Dinosaur National Monument and the green. After we did this project, we did another small one, another hole in the donut project on the Yampa River, uh, upstream near Steamboat Springs in a great piece of fly fishing water. Uh, I, I spent a couple summers up fly fishing this uh, section of the river. Um, 
This was a property uh, that a lot of the locals knew about. It had this uh, historic cabin on it, but it was technically private and it was surrounded by a whole bunch of public lands. You can look here and see, you know, here's the red here and I'm gonna enlarge it for you. You can look at on one side, it had Sarvis Creek Wilderness Area. It had a BLM public access point here and it had a Sarvis Creek State Wilderness Area here, all public lands, but it was almost impossible to get into that property by, you know, without being trespassing. And it had some of the best fly fishing water on it as well. So we were able to buy it. It's only like a small half mile, but it's now connected all this. Um, the Yampa Valley Stream Improvement Association has been doing a restoration downstream of it. Um, it was highly uh, uh, popular with the local fly fishing shops and different uh, Trout Unlimited and other groups that we were able to ultimately buy this and create access. And the last river I'm gonna talk about before we go into Q&A is one of my, uh, my home, home waters, the John Day River in North Central Oregon. And the John Day is the second longest free flowing river in the West. Actually, it's the longest free flowing river uh, in the West side of the Rockies. Uh, the only other river that is longer is the Yellowstone. Um, it has some of the best sagebrush steppe habitat in the Columbia River Basin. It's a Columbia River tributary. It has the single best uh, uh, run of wild summer steelhead in the entire Columbia River Basin. It is an amazing smallmouth bass fishery in the summertime. And where you'll find me in October and November fishing for that summer steelhead run, that this is you'll find me on the John Day. It's one of my absolute fa favorite places to be. Um, we've done uh, several projects. Our first project was an over 16,000 acre project that helped create Cottonwood Canyon State Park. This was a property that was owned by a rancher on one of the rare places on the lower John Day where a, a hot state highway crossed it. The rancher was not friendly to public access, but the property came up after the landowner's death. We were able to purchase it and ultimately conveyed it to the state of Oregon, creating Cottonwood Canyon State Park, the second largest state park in the Oregon State Park system, opening 13 miles of the John Day to public access. Just incredible hiking, fishing, boating, horseback riding, um, and, um, and even hunting. It's one of the few Oregon State Parks where hunting is allowed for, for uh, chucker, upland birds, uh, deer. And as I mentioned, like chucker are some of the other bird species here as well that are really important. So chucker is really the, the key game species. Uh, but there's also ferruginous hawks and burrowing owls that can be seen on this property. Um, and after purchasing that, another ranching property upstream became available at 30 Mile Creek, the former Rattray Ranch, on another 11 miles of the John Day and four and a half miles of 30 Mile Creek. Um, this is a spectacular property. It's the property where bighorn sheep were reintroduced into Oregon's uh, John Day Canyon uh, around, I think, close to 40 years ago. Um, the third is now at about 650 uh, sheep. Uh, really beautiful, beautiful area. Um, to kind of show you how this all works together, this is the Columbia River up top here that separates Oregon, Washington State and Oregon. Uh, this is the John Day River. The purple properties are the, uh, the Cottonwood Canyon State Park. The yellow is a 43-mile float through BLM Wilderness Study Area that is only uh, accessible by a float trip. And here's the property that we bought down here on the uh, Rattray Ranch. And then also another five miles of three of 30 Mile Creek from another uh, family up, upstream called the Campbell family. Um, this is now a public access site. It was uh, a pay to play before this, uh, limited. It's now been conveyed to the BLM for public access. Um, it's really important because this allows for a great family float, multi-day float from 30 Mile Creek down to Cottonwood Canyon State Park. There's no technical water in this section. Uh, the next access point upstream is uh, 20 miles up at Clarno, and there's a major four uh, class four rapid there that if you get into that, you are having a really bad uh, start to your trip if you uh, dump out in that rapid. So this uh, makes for an easier trip and also gets to avoid that rapid if you want to. But the, the really important part of this project was 30 Mile Creek. And 30 Mile Creek produces the largest steelhead smolts 
of all of the uh, lower Columbia or lower uh, John Day River tributary streams. And uh, science has proved that the larger the smolts are when they go out to the ocean, the, the more uh, able they are to get back and come back and spawn. Uh, one of the issues, however, with this stream is there was a flood in 1964 that widened the stream and by lack of and loss of riparian started some of the stream to flow underground. So by purchasing this property, it's allowing other partners to work on restoration of the stream, working to get it into a more narrow channel over time, planting riparian plants, working to fence it off, and working with other ranchers upstream as well. And then we just this summer bought another three mile property on the John Day, uh, downstream of the, uh, the state park on McDonald's Ferry, which we are hoping within another three years to make this a public access point through the BLM as well. It also uh, sits on, it's called McDonald's Ferry because it is on the old Oregon um, trail. And you can see right here, this family is walking on the, uh, those are wagon ruts from the uh, Oregon Trail, you know, back in the 1860s. So pretty uh, historic property as well. It will also, this property has a, a tributary stream that has been disconnected from the river because of agricultural use. Uh, and will allow ultimately once it's conveyed to uh, get that stream reconnected to the river and provide another spawning habitat. Um, we love to say when we buy a river, it belongs to everyone. We encourage you to go to our website, westernrivers.org. I'm gonna take you just on a quick, very quick tour of the website here and just do another quick screen share. And uh, if you're interested in doing this, I, I, I would be remiss if I, I am the director of donor relations, we'd love for you to go and make a donation to the organization. But if you'd just like to learn more about us, if you scroll down on our homepage, there is a sign up for our newsletter tab. And we encourage you to do that as well. You'll get, among other things, a river of the month, uh, that highlights a river, how to fish it, access it. We also have all of the you know, information on our Discover tab, all of the information on our you know, past rivers of the month, uh, past uh, newsletters that we've done. Uh, so encourage you to go and uh, check out our website, westernrivers.org and uh, enjoy it. And at this point, uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Tom and Bruce and we can take on any questions we might have. Okay, thank you, Jim. I, this is an excellent presentation. The, uh, and this, uh, the work you're doing is outstanding. Um, I'm a wildlife biologist by profession that loves to fly fish. I'm never without a pair of binoculars around my neck. So I especially appreciate uh, the focus of the conservancy on these systems as not just fish habitat, but habitat important habitat for birds and other wildlife. Excellent, excellent. Bruce, I'll turn it over to you for questions that we may have. Great, we do have some questions, Tom, and thank you. And, and Jim, I just never tire of learning about the resourcefulness and the collaboration that the Western Rivers organization uses to find those gem properties and protect them and grant access to. It's just, to me, it's just, it's an amazing operation, amazing piece of work. Well, thank you, Bruce, and you, and you are a big part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased to be, a, to be a part of it. So we have a couple of questions here. Um, the first one, it says, um, fast, this is from Dave Peterson, fascinating and beautiful presentation. What are the biggest obstacles you face in making these purchases and what strategies have you used to overcome those obstacles? Boy, but they, <laughs> you know, every, every as, as Bruce could know, because we you know in our board meeting, we, we don't go public with a lot of the, you know, the, the, the obstacles, but every single property has, I mean, for example, sometimes if you're working with a ranching family, you have multiple family members that own the ranch and some of them want to sell and some don't. Uh, sometimes you're looking at a property that may have mineral rights or a house on it that, that's going to be hard to convey to a federal agency. Um, sometimes it's just a funding issue. I mean, it, it, there's, there, there's really you know, all, all kinds. 
I think the bottom part, the, the bottom line is it's our relationship because it's all about relationships. We always work with willing sellers and it's relationships with the, with the, the funding sources that we have and relationships with the federal and state agencies and the tribes that make the work successful. And so I think that because we are non-confrontational, you're never going to see us. I mean, you're never going to see us on on anything about take out the dams or uh, the pebble mine. Even though you can imagine where some of our personal loyalties may lie, we stay out of the politics because we never know where a landowner is going to be on the political scale. If they're doing it, and they have high conservation values or not. Um, and we just want to make we want to make it easy for them, and then we want to protect the river. So that's, uh, that's, you know, that's, I, in a nutshell, I mean, it's impossible to say what's the, they're all, they're, every single one is challenging, uh, but ultimately it's our relationships and the fact that we have, we, we try to have as good relationships with, with everybody involved to make the projects work. Would you, would you agree with that, Bruce? Absolutely. Yeah, and you know, sometimes there's an inclination to want to, to be, um, an advocate and to you know talk about how terrible the dams and the Snake River are, for example, but th but that's not that's not where Western Rivers is is very is effective, and so they're very smart about keeping themselves out of the political fray and choosing sides, and I think we all benefit from that. So I like that. Jim, I've, I have I've got a question, uh, BFMA, please. Uh, you mentioned that you do some work with commercial timber companies. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, we've done we've done have, many uh, things. With have them. you ever um, worked with them to for them to convey conservation easements that they may uh, offer as conservation measures for other land uses that may require permitting and conservation measures? That, that's a great question. And right now we are actually working with Warehouser in the Hood River system in Oregon. Uh, they have the, the what's called the Mid-Columbia Valley Tree Farm. And, part, and Hood River is a kind of artsy area that's been expanding. And one of the issues is having that expand toward the river and also logging, you know, the Oregon's logging practices in terms of what they, what a timber company legally can do and what it really is good for the river are often two different things. And so we're working with Weyerhaeuser to be able to put a conservation easement that allows for a much larger riparian mm -hmm. area along the river will limit uh, the amount of real estate that is gonna be, that could have been created yeah. and also, you know, ultimately protect the stream provide access so yes we that sometimes we, we we always like to be able to do a full uh fee you know fee simple uh purchase if we can but it, sometimes you know this is one where there is a value to having the commercial timber in this area it's just that if we can make it so it's more viable with the protection of a couple of key tributary streams um yeah. and then we're doing that yeah i've, I've worked with uh after I left state work, work with a number of timber companies here in southeastern U.S., specifically in Florida, and, and they were quite amenable in many cases to granting conservation easements as conservation measures. Yeah, and that we have a win-win. Like win. And as, as Bruce and I mentioned, because we kind of stay out of the political fray, we have really good relationships with timber companies. That's good. That's good. Other questions, Bruce? And so we have one comment from uh, Rick Williams, the FFI Senior Conservation Advisor, who um, was the chairman of the casting group before me and one of my great mentors and has an unbelievable knowledge of, of everything Salmonid. So um, a terrific guy, I respect him very much. Um, and he says, um, it appears to me that much of the work and philosophy behind the WRC's fabulous work is extremely compatible with our native fish conservation area work that we do with our partners TU and Fisheries Conservation Foundation. It would be good to have the folks at WRC be aware of NSCA, which may present additional conservation and marketing opportunities that opportunities that would expand their work. Super, let's work on that, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I can find Rick, so I can I can follow up on that one. Absolutely. Okay, well, 
folks, we're, we're approaching the end of our hour we've set for this. So I, I do, Jim, I wanna thank you again, uh, not just for your presentation, but for some very excellent and relevant conservation work as far as I'm concerned. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, before we close, uh, I'd like to remind everybody again that this webinar and others have been recorded and they're available for you on the FFI website right there at the top, bold. You can't uh, miss the links that are there for these webinars. Again, the only reason this webinar exists tonight is with your support. Your support is very important to us. This is your webinar. So uh, please continue your membership. If there are those on the webinar tonight that are not yet members, please join. Encourage others to do so, support FFI, what we do, and leave a personal legacy of your own for fly fishing, conservation, and yourselves. And we thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you very much again, Jim. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Tom. You bet. Thank you as well, Bruce. Good night, everyone. <laughs>